mysterious messages. That is an ambigram. Secret cults. Deadly conspiracies. That's Illuminati. Brutal murders. And an epic battle between faith and reason. Our church is at war. Like the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown's best-selling novel, Angels and Demons, ignites both controversy and outrage. The conspiracies that Dan deals with, the intensity of the ongoing curiosity, it's staggering. There wasn't a powerful organization on Earth they didn't penetrate. But how much of its story of secret societies and papal scandals is based on historical fact? A lot of the intrigue and the secrecy comes from the place where science and religion meet. And could the Vatican's centuries-old reluctance to embrace modern science really be a cover-up to one of the greatest and most profound mysteries in the universe? Who doesn't love a good conspiracy theory? It has to be here! Four cardinals were kidnapped from their quarters inside the Vatican sometime between 3 and 5 a.m. this morning. These criminals who sent this ambigram meant it as a taunt, a provocation. But Captain Olivetti think if you can use it to learn their identity, perhaps we can stop this abomination. Why me? Your expertise, your erudition, your recent involvement with certain church, shall we say, mysteries. Robert Langdon, academic, adventurer. As conceived in the mind of best-selling author Dan Brown, he's one of the smartest and most compelling heroes in modern literature and cinema. He's the world's only symbologist. The star on his skin? The Pinnacle is a pagan religious icon. He's got to have a knowledge of history, architecture, art, math, religious faiths. So he is constantly making these connections the way puzzle masters do. This is the first marker. The path is alive. With the publication of the Da Vinci Code in 2003, the character of Robert Langdon quickly secured his place in popular culture as one of the greatest fictional investigators since Sherlock Holmes. We've been dragged into a world of people who think this stuff is real. Real enough to kill for. But, as depicted in both The Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons, Langdon's exploits also added fuel to an already heated debate about the nature of religion, the foundations of faith, and even the very existence of God. What Dan Brown does is he blends history with these conspiracy theories that he's read about. He rarely invents one, you know, he extrapolates from. Collisions are fixed and running. And then he blends his imagination and builds these incredibly imaginative thrillers. The story of Angels and Demons involves the theft of one of the most lethally explosive devices ever created capable of delivering the equivalent of a five kiloton atomic blast. The device will annihilate not only a conclave of cardinals gathered to elect the next pope, but Vatican City. The Catholic Church, as we know it, could be destroyed. As Dan Brown suggested in Angels and Demons, there are dark forces trying to destroy the Catholic Church. Um, and, you know, one wonders who, who are these dark forces exactly? In appreciating the fact that Dan Brown can very successfully weave together facts that people know to be true and fiction for the sake of drama is impressive, but it also puts me in the position where people are asking questions about, wow, is that really true? I'm sure that the church itself would say yes. Dark forces are always trying to attack Christianity, that Satan is always trying to and oppose Christ. In Angels and Demons, the first key to decoding the motivations behind the Vatican plot lies with a mysterious killer who, after setting the explosive, kidnaps four prominent cardinals and prepares them for ritual sacrifice. According to the novel, 
The killer is a direct descendant of a real-life 11th century Persian group known as the Hashashin. These hired killers flourished during the Christian Crusades and gave birth to the modern-day term, assassin. According to legend, the members of the group carried out their assignments while under the influence of hashish, thus giving them their name, Hashashin. The assassin, the Hashashin, are mercenaries. Basically, you would hire them out, and they were very effective killers, and they would go do basically your dirty work for you. The assassins were a militaristic sect whose job was to kill other varieties of Muslims who they believed were heretics. Very often, an assassin killer would be put into the courts of a Muslim ruler, and he'd be there as a sort of sleeper. And he could be there for many years, working his way up in, in positions of authority. And so one day he received a message saying, kill your ruler. And he would do just that. He would kill him with a sword, usually publicly, very often in a mosque. And the idea was to make it a public spectacle and to bring fear, to bring horror into the hearts and minds of the people who the assassins were opposed to. In Angels and Demons, the assassin's gruesome work isn't done in a mosque, but in churches throughout Rome. But it's the Vatican itself that's ultimately the target of a unique time bomb stolen from a secret laboratory known as CERN. That canister contains an extremely combustible substance called antimatter. The antimatter is suspended there in an airtight nanocomposite shell with electromagnets on each end. But if it were to fall out of suspension and come in contact with matter, say the bottom of the canister, then the two opposing forces would annihilate one another violently. Now what might cause it to fall out of suspension? The battery going dead, which it will just before midnight. Vatican City will be consumed by light. But just what is CERN? Established in 1954 by a coalition of 12 West European countries, CERN actually exists as a physics laboratory and research center located near Geneva, Switzerland. Its early years were devoted to atomic research, but the organization gained what is perhaps its greatest fame in the early 1990s when scientists Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Caillot invented a little something called the World Wide Web. In recent years, CERN has caused quite a stir within the scientific community by attempting to harness and study one of the most elusive and most volatile elements in the known universe, antimatter. We are made of matter. Matter is made of small particles. They have fancy names like electron, proton. Now, antimatter is in some sense the mirror image of that matter. So proton has a positive charge, Antiproton has a negative charge. Antimatter is actually very familiar. Uh, it sounds like this weird science fiction thing, but actually it's very commonly used uh, in, in hospitals for diagnosis of cancer and things like that. And there you have a modest amount of positrons, which then interact with the electrons, their opposite twins, in the body, and that produces high energy light rays, which then you can image using various detectors. The resulting burst of light, when the positive charge meets the negative, means that the matter and antimatter have completely destroyed each other during contact. In the scientific world, that process is called annihilation. You can also use the word destruction, but annihilation has the aspect that afterwards, nothing material is left, it's all gone in radiation. Because antimatter does not naturally exist in our world, the only way to study it is to make it. Inside CERN, there is a machine called Alpha, dedicated to producing one specific form of antimatter, antihydrogen. But there are two sides to this device, essentially. This part of the device mostly has to do with antiprotons on the left side of this apparatus here. This is a source for positrons. We then put it all together in this device. Antiprotons and positrons are mixed and make the antihydrogen. We store antimatter just like it's described in the book. We're using um, electric fields and magnetic fields to keep the charged antiparticles away from um, matter. 